So we're going to verse 18 of Matthew 1. So we're going to look for a little bit at Joseph's life. Uh, what kind of a man. Does anybody remember reading in the Bible about the father of Jesus, the human father? What kind of a man he was? Do most people remember the story? Just raise your hand and feel like you remember the story a little bit. Yeah, I'm just asking that question though. I said, how many remember the story of Jesus' father, Joseph? Anybody? Can you guys remember it, Roman? Do you remember the story? Do you remember when you said anything about Joseph? Okay, Eli, do you remember anything? Okay, Miss Susan, do you remember? Okay, Miss Geraldine raised her hand. Hey, do you remember anything about Joseph, Kelly? Not really? You do? Okay, so, some do. Okay, well, um, Joseph, Joseph was a godly man. I want us to look at verse 18. It says, this is how, how many would hold their Bibles up and read with, read along as I'm reading. Okay, it says, this is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man, and did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. So what I want us to notice here is that um, Joseph was a righteous man. Can you see that? And it says because he was a righteous man, he did something. He did not want to disgrace Mary when, when she was found to be with a child. He, he had love and respect for her. And he didn't understand what was going on. But even if she had done something terribly sinful herself, he didn't want to expose her to public disgrace. But he couldn't, he couldn't go up forward with the marriage because it would cause him to sin. If, if she had been immoral, for him to marry her, it would have caused him to uh, commit sin. So he planned to divorce her quietly. Divorce her because he was engaged. And in that day, if you were, uh, if you were engaged, it was similar to being married today as far as legally. If, if you were engaged to someone, then you had to get divorced to break the relationship. So he, he was planning to go ahead with the divorce because that was legal if she had been immoral. It was legal. So what I want you to notice so far is that he was all about obedience to God and his law. Can you tell that so far? Okay. So uh, after he considered this, this was all he could think to do. How many are with me at verse 20? I mean, looking at verse 20. Okay. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. The word Jesus means Joshua. It's, it's a version of Joshua, and Joshua means the Lord saves. So he understood by the name what he, the baby would be. Uh, and so all of this took place, all of this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel which means God with us. And when Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him to do, and he took Mary home as his wife, but he had no union with her until she gave birth to a son. And then we see again his obedience. 
he gave him the name Jesus. So, um, so we see one obedience after another. One step of obedience right after another. Amen? There was no area that he did not obey God uh, completely. So, uh, so I want us to notice in chapter 2 how that, uh, that pattern is repeated. In verse 13 of chapter 2, the, the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said, take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. So he did exactly what the angel said. And so it was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son. So Joseph, uh, just like Jesus, fulfilled every prophecy that had to do with his time on earth. Joseph was a part of the fulfillment of every prophecy. God knew he could trust Joseph. And when Herod realized that he had been outwitted, he was furious and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. Then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. Uh, a voice is heard in Rama weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted because they are not one. So after Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph. What do you think Joseph's going to do this time? Do you think he's going to do what God says to do? Have you noticed his pattern? So it happens again. The Lord appears in a dream to Joseph. Get up, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel. For those who were trying to take the child's life are dead. So he got up, took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Ar 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 Archelaus was reigning in Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. He was warned. So then he had a dream, and he was warned in the dream, and so he withdrew to Galilee. And he went and lived in a town called Nazareth. So it was fulfilled what was said through the prophets he will be called a Nazarene. So what is your opinion of Joseph? What is your opinion of Joseph? Samuel, Samuel, what is your opinion? What do you think about Joseph? What kind of a man is he? That's what over and over again. Sin. Sins over and over again. What does he do? <laughs> okay. Miss Green, what does he do over and over again? He obeys God. Over. Every single time, he obeys God. So, so I want you to think about Joseph, about Jesus growing up in this home with a godly father, human father, that is under the old covenant and yet lives like being under the new covenant. He's like the heroes of the Old Testament that, that operated in faith. Uh, when they didn't have the whole picture like we have. Right. So how many impressed with Joseph? Amen. How many impressed with this man who Jesus was raised by? He, he got to watch his father live out the gospel Amen. in front of him. Amen. The gospel that he could live because his son was going to go to the cross. Can you wrap your mind around that a minute? Because his son... Jesus had, had the truth in him uh, and that through his death, his own father, human father, could live this glorious gospel. Amen. Isn't that awesome? Yes. So what, did everybody get their copy yet? 
Yes. Can I get one, please? Yes. Okay. So I didn't get one at home. Thank you. Okay. It's okay. It's okay. I don't know what I did with it. Okay. So tonight, this is what we're going to go over. Um, does everybody have a copy of this? Everybody get this? Okay. So what I said, what we studied now is going to go along with what we have here. So uh, the question is, why do Christians, quote, unquote, not win sinners to Christ? Oh, uh, something's missing there. Okay, just a word. Um, so the Holy Spirit is given so that we be witnesses, right? right? The main reason that we receive the Holy Spirit is so that we will be witnesses. Uh, first of all, the Holy Spirit births us into the kingdom, but then the purpose is that we will be witnesses to Christ and salvation. So, oh goodness, Frankie, the next part I can't read either. Well, I think the Holy Spirit is given. Yeah, that's fine. But what is, oh, I see. It goes down to the. Okay. Okay. Okay, it finishes down on the next line. Sorry, I didn't see that. Okay. So, it cannot be the fault of the Holy Spirit if we do not win people to Christ. So, it has to be the fault of the person. So we can put it on the Holy Spirit and say it's the Holy Spirit's fault. But the Holy Spirit is God. Yeah. And and the Holy Spirit cannot fail. Amen. The Holy Spirit cannot fail. Right. So the next paragraph says, if we are true Christians, God has called us to save the world. Amen. In order to save the world, we have to convince sinners that they need God. Right. So, um, Sinners will not think much about these things unless they are convinced by true believers. So what are sinners thinking about? What are sinners absorbed in? What is the world caught up in? Think, think about lots of stuff. Think about one thing and let's call them out. What's one thing that the world is caught up in? Stuff. Stuff. Okay, material things. Okay? Buying more things, possessing more things. What else? What else is the word? What's that? The volume day. I'm sorry, there's a noise up here. Uh, the volume, uh, Charles, yell out what she's saying. Uh, the artists that are gay. Uh, the the volume volume. artists and stuff. Oh, getting caught up like uh, with idols? Like uh, cultural idols? Okay, yeah. Okay, great. All right. I mean, that's true. Huh? Money. Doing what they want to do. Just pleasure and pastimes and just being selfish. Just being so selfish. Okay. How much of that? How much of the person's time does all that stuff absorb? How much do you think of of the sinner, the worldly person? How much of their time does these things you mentioned absorb of their time and their and their attention? Huh? 100%. 100%. Yeah. They, are, they are so caught. Their attention is riveted on, we could have said media, we could have said phones, Facebook, we could, how many know we could have gone farther? Yeah. But you all got the picture. So, so their attention is on these things 100% of the time. Right. Okay. So is their is there attention going to be on God, on heaven, on what they need to do in their life, do you think? So their attention is on that nearly zero. Okay? So I said if, if we are true Christians, God has called us to save the world. In order to save the world, we have to convince sinners they need God. Sinners will not think much about these things. Right. Sinners won't be thinking about these things. I mean, understand that. Right. True. Unless they are convinced by true believers. Or some terrible thing that happens, they might wake up. But uh, So these are the things that we're to convince. Roman, read the first one. Uh, these are the things we have to convince the world and sinners of. The first one. Okay, so we have to convince them of the reality of heaven and hell. Yes. yes. 
See, I, and I got all of this tonight. I want you to know where I got it from. This is my book. It's by it's Finney, Charles Finney, Lectures on Revival. Uh, and, and it's all in ch chapter... Uh, I'm, I'm going to give it to you afterwards so that you can... Okay, so do you know what that last word in the sentence is, Roman? Okay, in, in what? Say it again. That's close. Okay, most people don't know what this word is, Roman. I was wondering if you did. Okay, most people don't know. Huh? Do, do you know what it is, Lanisa? Oh, okay. Um, let's see. Norma, do you know what that word is? Okay. Uh, immortality is how you pronounce it. Immortality. Does anybody know what it means? Not dying. That you, that you will not die. That you, you will live. Doesn't mean you won't die physically. But your soul will live forever. Yes. And so the world is not convinced of these things at all. Right. They're not convinced that there's a hell. Uh, probably people are more convinced that there's a heaven and that everybody's going there. Yeah. Um, but then some people believe that when you die, it's all over. And we have to convince, true believers convince the world of immortality. That your soul and my soul will never die. Right. That our soul will live forever in where? Heaven or, heaven or hell. One or the other. So, do you, how many people do you think really believe that? Do you think very many people in the world believe that? I mean, when you start talking to an unsafe person, <laughs> very few believe these things. So, they don't want to believe it. So, so, if you call yourself a true Christian, your responsibility is to convince sinners of these things. This is not all we have to convince them of. But that's the witness of the church. Um, if we want to win people to Christ, we have to convince them of these things. Right. Okay? Number two. Uh, Miss Susan, would you read number two? So, because most people never think about it uh, in the world and don't think that they've committed enough sins to be sent to hell if there is a hell, we have a job to do. If we want to win people to Christ, which we have to because otherwise their blood will be on us, uh, we have to convince them. And so... The, the best way to convince is, of course, what the Bible says, but also what we know in our heart. Amen? Amen. Because we knew that we were bound for hell before we got saved or we wouldn't have gotten saved. And we now know that we have the hope of heaven. And that's something in your heart. It's, it's in the Word that we, we know it from, from our own experience of salvation. Um, so... Number three, we have to convince people that think everything that they have is satisfying, is what they want to satisfy them, right? Number three, uh, Mr. Juan, can you read number three? Things of earth do not satisfy the soul, only Jesus does. Okay, so people that are convinced that what they're doing and partaking it is satisfying them, we have to convince them that it's not satisfying them. That nothing of earth can really satisfy them. Wow. So how would we convince them of that? How would we convince them that all of these things that they're partaking in and that they're loving and that they're doing are not really satisfying their soul. Right. How about by your life? The life that you live? 
and you don't do the things, you don't go after the things that they go after. And they see that your happiness is not dependent on the next thing that you get to do or have. You don't have any of those things and you don't do those things. And yet you have something they don't have. Amen. Number four, Miss Brandy. Jesus Christ loves sinners and can save them from hell. Okay. So, so once they're convinced that they're sinners, um, it is our responsibility to convince people that Jesus Christ loves sinners and that we love sinners, and that Christ can save them from this hell. Um, this forever, living forever in torture, in punishment, um, and that we are all about helping them to escape hell. They had to add more and have space. So, and then five, Jesus radically changes those who come to him. Do you understand that we have to convince people of that? And they don't even, a lot of them don't think they need to be changed. They like life the way it is. But to witness for Christ, we have to we have to convince them that Jesus radically changes those who come to him. Amen? And that number six, people must live a holy life through Jesus Christ to go to heaven. So we have to convince them by our life that uh, that it's a, it's a real change that to go to heaven you have to live a holy life you have to live a life of self-denial. You have to live above the world. That I can't do what you do. I can't go where you go. I don't want to do what you do. I am living for Christ. I'm living for heaven. So, uh, so without words, our lives should have a radical impact on those around us. Teaching them these things. So even without speaking, without words, our lives should have a radical impact on those around us. Amen. Amen? Amen. 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 Teaching them these things. By the life we live, they should know these truths by the life we live. And then sharing the gospel, sharing gospel truth is the icing on the cake. So you cannot share the gospel if you're not living this life. If you're not living the life of a Christian, you cannot share the gospel. Um, it will have no weight. It will have no power if you are not living the life. So uh, then, without the witness of true Christians, sinners will go to hell. How many believe that? Without the witness of true Christians, sinners will go to hell. But most believers turn sinners off to Christ. Please listen to this. But most believers turn sinners off to Christ. Now I'm going to give some quotes what, let me ask you, why would, the, why would people who call themselves believers turn sinners off to Christ? Why would people, Ms. Geraldine, who call themselves Christians turn sinners off to Christ? They see what they're doing that's not right. Wow. So these, the, all these are quotes from Finney. If the church lived for Christ for one week, sinners would melt before them. Wow. Wow. Please underline it if you have a, a pen. If the church, and I quote, un, quote, unquote, church, because it's the people that go into the building, but they're not living for Christ. Because if the church lived for Christ for one week, sinners would melt before them. What do you think about that? 
statement. That means would come to Christ through their life. In weeping, brokenness. Wow. Well, what do you think about it, Larissa? You were reading it in Finney. I read that and I reread chapter 7. Yes. No innocent amusements. Wow. But most Christians live as if what the pastor preaches are lies. Wow. Probably should say is lies. Wow. Most Christians live as if what the pastor, and I put quotes on Christian. Most, this is a statement of Finney. Most Christians live as if what the pastor preaches is law. I guess it would be is lies. Is lies. Wow. Probably 99% of the preaching is fruitless because the congregation contradicts it. You know, it, it, I want you to think about Christ is the one that's being judged. Christ in the gospel is being judged by the world. And we are called to take the witness stand. How many can understand? Yes. By the life we live, we are called to take the witness stand as a witness. And he, then he says, most Christians take the witness stand against Christ. Most Christians perjure themselves. They, they take the stand against Christ and against the gospel by the life they're living. So he says, you can't help but testify by your life and by your words. Amen. You can't help to test, but testify by your life and by your words. You are testifying for or against Christ every day you live and in everything you do. Amen. Amen. You can't help but testify by your life and by your words. You are testifying for or against Christ. Christ, every day you live and everything you do. Wow. Amen. See, the reason that revival can't come to churches is because people in the church testify that they are Christians and yet by the life they live, they are denying Christ and denying the gospel. Let me ask you, do you think that someone's going to go to heaven on profession? Do you think that anyone will get into heaven because they say they're a Christian? Right? So, so we understand that many are going to come and say, Lord, Lord. And he says, not everyone who says, Lord, not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, is going to get into heaven. But only... Those who do the what of God. Only those who do the will of God. So I'm, I'm going to read a little bit more from this chapter. And you can take a look if you want to. I've got about three paragraphs. I'm going to read. He says, the testimony of most people stands right in the path of revival. The testimony of most people who call themselves Christians, their testimony obstructs the way for revival. Their spirit and behavior turn the world off to spiritual things. Their spirit, their attitudes, and their behavior Turn the world off to spiritual things. How can the world believe in true Christianity? 
the sum of their whole testimony shouts that there's no need to be devoted to God. The sum of their whole testimony shouts that there is no need to be devoted to God. So he says, are these things true or are they ravings of a disturbed mind? Do we think of Finney as just a disturbed mind? He says, are they true? Do you think there would be a revival if the church was the way it ought to be? Do you think that revival would be so hard? A true move of God? No, it's not the ravings of a disturbed mind. But uh, he says, he says, if they're true, do you recognize that they apply to you? And how many understand that every single thing the Bible says applies to me if I'm a Christian? Everything God says applies to me, either negatively or positively, if I'm a Christian, if I say that I'm a Christian. Yes. And so it, it does us no good to say, well, in the 1800s, people were that way, or the church was that way. But the people today are that way. The church is that way today. Amen? Amen. He said, what is written about you today? He said, what is God saying about you today? In the record now sealed for the judgment. What is God saying about you and about me? Have you manifested sympathy with God's Son as His heart bleeds for the church's desolation? Have you manifested sympathy with God's Son as His heart bleeds for the church? How does Jesus feel about a church that denies Him by the life they live? What do you think about the heart of Christ who died for the church? Do you think Christ's heart bleeds, aches, hurts because there's so much talk and so little walk? There's so little burden for any thing of the kingdom. There's so little prayer. Amen? Yes. How many can yes. say, I know I, I don't have the prayer life I ought to have? Raise your hand. I know I don't have the prayer life. I don't have times of weeping over lost people. So, is Christ going to weep alone? Is Christ going to bleed? His heart bleed? It says, have your children, have your friends, have your co-workers seen your heart bleed? Have your children, your friends, your co-workers seen your heart bleed? We can only imagine what that is. Have people seen our heart bleed? Do you think that that would signal to people that I'm for real? Do you think that would signal to God that I'm for real? Amen? Have they seen solemnness in your face and tears in your eyes in view of perishing people? Have they seen solemnness in your face and tears in your eyes in view of perishing souls? A hundred and fifty plus thousand people dying every single day. Probably a hundred and sixty thousand with all the coronavirus right now. And if we can go through a day and not weep over this sea of humanity that most of them are plunging into hell on a daily basis, you know, if we don't think about it, we won't weep about it. If we don't make it a point to be conscious every day that over 153,000 people in the world are dying, and we can't do much for most of them other than pray, which is the best thing, <laughs> Pray that someone will come to them and speak to them before they die. Pray that the Holy Spirit will move in power on them to repent before they die. I find myself praying every day for those that will die. 
pray in that 24 hour period. And I have so many things to pray about, I have to pray for a long time. Because I can't say, oh Lord, help those people that are dying. I have to pray for my heart. I cannot just speak a few words about something so terrible. If I do, I'm disingenuous. It's not coming from my heart if there's no tears. But that is appalling. How many people are sinking into hell every day? Every minute, there's a death clock that shows us every minute how many people are dying. You can go online and see it. And so, whatever happens to us in our prayer time is what will happen to us when we're not in prayer. If we are falling on our face in sorrow over what's happening to humanity daily, then we're going to find every opportunity that we can to go to people because we, guys, we're not sincere if we're praying for those people and don't go to the people next door. Yeah. And don't go to the people on our street. And the people at our work. I said a couple weeks ago, or maybe last week, that I'm praying for believers all over the world. But I can't pray for them to be on fire if I'm not on fire. If, if I'm not doing what I'm praying for them to do, then I'm a phony. Can I get any agreement on that? So he says, finally I close with the commitment, the comment that God and all moral beings have solid, solid reason to claim to complain about false testimony. Please hear me again. It's a little bit hard. I close with a comment that God and all moral beings, all human beings, have solid reason to complain about false testimony. When I claim something that I'm not, God has every right to complain about me. And all people that will go to hell without God have reason to complain. There is ground to object when God's witnesses turn and testify point blank against them. There is ground to object when God's witnesses turn and testify point blank against them. By the life that we live, testifying against him. Does anybody get it? Raise your hand if you feel like you can understand what I'm reading. Guys, this is for us. Thank God. Finney's dead, but his words are still living. Because he did what he talks about. More people were saved to this man's life than I think anyone that ever lived. More than Paul, probably. He says, unbelievers de declare, okay, believers, he's talking, believers declare by their conduct that the gospel is untrue. Believers declare by their conduct, believers, quote, unquote, that, that the gospel is untrue. They declare by their love of the world by their love of things, by their love of this and that and everything else, by, their, by the fact they have no burden for lost people. They have no burden for revival. They declare by their conduct that the gospel is not true, that the gospel does not change our life. The gospel does not make us a radical, world-changing, Witness for Jesus Christ. That's what the gospel says. The gospel says that if we repent and put our faith in Jesus Christ, we will receive the Holy Spirit and we will be His witnesses. 